Let's see. The people are still coming. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jingdong Tian. Uh, Jingdong did his undergraduate work in China uh, in the University of Shandong. And from there, he came to do his PhD here in, uh, in New York. From there, he moved to a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and joined George Church's lab and published uh, what in this field in synthetic biology is considered one of the seminal papers, a landmark paper, where he used on-chip design of uh, genes and synthesis assembly of multiple genes, almost genome scale synthesis. Uh, and that propelled the field of synthetic genomics, making it more possible to think of building genomes by synthesizing short oligonucleotides or slightly longer oligonucleotides on arrays. So many of you who've done chip-chip or have looked at hybridization of your RNA on arrays are essentially looking at fragments of your genome on a glass slide. So you can synthesize a whole genome. The reverse is not so trivial, taking it off the glass and converting it into a complete functional genome. And that's what he was able to do. Since then, he's been at Duke since 2005 in a, set up his own laboratory and has expanded the application to many exciting areas. Uh, and you'll hear some of that today. And just today I discovered that he also has a lab uh, in China and he has a couple companies. So if any of you would like to benefit from his technology, he is ready and able and willing, if the project is interesting, to help you along. And so with that, I would like to, and he's won a bunch of awards um, during this work. As a graduate student, he was Sigma Xi, best graduate work. So it's an early indication of excellence to come. As a postdoc, he had one of the most prestigious postdoc fellowships, LSRF, Life Science Research Fellowships. And then as a junior faculty member, he won the Beckman Award, which is again, a hallmark and very prestigious um, fellowship to uh, receive. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what he's going to tell us today. Um, and with that, let me give you Professor Tien. Welcome to Madison. Thanks for the uh, nice introduction. And you basically, uh, I mean, that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and thanks for the invitation. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so I've been on campus a few times before and uh, working on some collaborations with the, uh, uh, the Biotechnology Center. Uh, at that time, Frank, Franco Serena uh, was still here. And uh, so we collaborated on uh, some of the uh, rework uh, Bio, uh, uh, bio rework, and uh, and that started uh, uh, actually our work on the uh, uh, building genes using the uh, microarray uh, derived uh, oligonucleotides. So it's a great pleasure to come back, and actually this is the first time I visit the uh, the biochemistry uh, department, and uh, it'd be nice to make uh, new friends. Uh, so, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, one of the technologies that we have developed. Uh, uh, which is the uh, called integrated high throughput on chip gene synthesis platform. And uh, then we're going to talk about some applications of this technology in the uh, building uh, genes and genomes uh, in a large scale. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my group has been uh, focusing on uh, technology development uh, for the field of synthetic biology. And uh, 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 as you, you, you may know that uh, synthetic biology is a, a relatively young field and uh, with many uh, promising uh, applications in a lot of significant uh, areas such as uh, bioenergy, uh, making chemicals, materials, uh, agriculture, medicine, uh, environment. And uh, it's interesting to uh, point out that uh, I mean, realize, to realize all these uh, significant applications in these many different fields, uh, you essentially need only to uh, manipulate one molecule, which is uh, uh, DNA. And uh, therefore, it's very uh, it's critical to uh, be able to design and synthesize uh, uh, DNA molecules in order to realize all sorts of different uh, kind of functions. Uh, so that's the uh, one of the driven force of why uh, uh, I did this, I mean, uh, working on the uh, technology development in this field. 
so as you know, uh, DNA, depending on the size, can encode many different uh, uh, functions, right, from the smallest uh, single gene, right, in the uh, length of uh, 1 kb uh, average, to uh, all the way to uh, uh, full genomes, right? Uh, so, so beyond single genes, at uh, one uh, at uh, 10 to the fourth level, you can have uh, big plasmids, genetic circuits, right? And if you can synthesize uh, DNAs that large, you can essentially build networks, uh, uh, pathways, uh, and uh, plasmids to uh, uh, do a lot of functional studies. And uh, next level above, uh, if you go to 10 to the fifth, you can have essentially uh, small viral genomes. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, even the minimal uh, genome, uh, I mean, you can actually uh, pick functional genes and assemble them into a uh, self-replicating uh, genome, the so-called minimal genome, to prove that you, you can actually, I mean, understand how life works, right? You, if you can build such a genome that can self-replicate uh, 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 itself. Uh, so that's a, uh, a proof of, I mean, you understand life. And uh, if you go the next level, go to 10 to the 6, uh, you can essentially have the, uh, uh, one of the smallest uh, bacteria genome. And uh, uh, from, from that on, you can build uh, other types of even higher, uh, bigger genomes. So, uh, I mean, in order to uh, study and uh, uh, engineer all these systems, uh, a crucial technology is to uh, design and also to uh, fabricate, right, this, uh, uh, sequences from scratch, and uh, <clears throat> so people have been doing uh, DNA synthesis uh, from the beginning, uh, right after the discovery of uh, DNA double helix structure, right? Uh, and one of the first person that uh, uh, to start DNA synthesis is actually uh, Dr. Krana, and uh, he spent 10 years uh, on this campus. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he won Nobel Prize for, uh, for his work uh, uh, partially on the uh, DNA synthesis. Uh, so he's one of the, uh, the first person who actually started uh, this whole field of DNA synthesis. And uh, uh, so from that time uh, on, and people start to build uh, a larger and larger constructs using uh, uh, a slightly different chemistry uh, than uh, what was initially uh, down, and uh, so until uh, today, just a, a year before, uh, actually people have been able to synthesize uh, artificial, not artificial genome, but uh, uh, one of the smallest genome, it's a replica of one of the smallest genome, uh, which is uh, about have one million bases, right, and they put that into, back into a cell which is, uh, have been extracted uh, uh, of its own genome and prove that uh, this synthetic genome actually can uh, uh, keep the cell alive and, uh, uh, and functioning. So that's uh, first, uh, one of the first proofs that uh, show that synthetic genome actually can have a, uh, uh, the necessary function to support, uh, support life. So that's basically a, a brief history of uh, uh, DNA synthesis. And uh, uh, it's interesting to point out that uh, all these years, the chemistry involved in DNA synthesis is basically the same, right? The phosphoramidite chemistry. And uh, the uh, synthesizers are developed uh, based on that. Uh, but it's still, uh, even though people can synthesize a genome as big as uh, one million bases, uh, the, it's still very tedious and very expensive. And uh, only maybe one or two lab can afford to do that, right? So that's normally, uh, that's obviously not sufficient for the, uh, uh, the whole field of synthetic biology to, uh, to develop uh, all kinds of different functions. Uh, so to do that, um, one of the critical uh, uh, technology to develop is actually uh, 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 the uh, uh, large scale, uh, high throughput automated gene synthesis technology. And uh, so that's uh, what uh, I have been uh, doing. And if you compare the, uh, 
uh, uh, DNA synthesis technology, the development of DNA synthesis technology with the uh, sequencing technology, uh, actually you can see that, uh, I mean, they are pretty similar. Uh, it's just that the DNA synthesis technology has been far lagged behind the uh, sequencing technology. If you look at the, uh, the development of sequencing technology in the 1990s, uh, people are pretty much doing sequencing uh, by hand, right? Uh, so you do the reactions, you run the big sequencing gel, expose it, and, uh, and then read the, uh, the lens uh, one, by, I mean, uh, one by one to uh, get the sequence. And in the uh, 2000s, uh, uh, people developed the automated uh, uh, DNA sequencer. Uh, so you can sequence uh, pretty much uh, a thousand or less than a thousand bases uh, in this automated uh, fluorescent uh, reaction. So you can, the computer can read it, right? Uh, so after sequencing, you can get a report from the computer. And now uh, we have single molecule or whole uh, genome sequencer where you can sequence a bacterial genome in a, uh, in a few days, right? Uh, for a few thousand dollars. So, uh, so the technology uh, for DNA sequencing has been uh, evolving pretty fast. And uh, uh, so where is DNA synthesis technology right now? I think it's still at probably this stage. Uh, I mean, we have automated DNA synthesizers, but that can only synthesize uh, oligonucleotides about maybe 100 bases uh, long, right? And uh, uh, from, that uh, from that on, if you want to build genes, which has uh, normally, I mean, 1,000 bases, uh, you pretty much, it's a manual process, right? You have to do it manually to, uh, in order to uh, assemble those oligos into genes. And uh, so in that sense, we are still at around this stage, and we are far from uh, building an automated uh, synthesizer where you can make, uh, which you can make, use it to uh, synthesize full genomes, uh, or a large-scale uh, production of many, many different genes, right? So we are still far, far away from that. But at least this, I mean, chart tells us where we are for uh, uh, DNA synthesis. So what are the, uh, the major challenges uh, in gene and genome synthesis? Uh, so in my opinion, there are at least three. One is the cost and the throughput for uh, oligonucleotide synthesis. It's still very expensive even to make the short oligos, right? Uh, and the next is uh, eliminating gene synthesis errors uh, because the chemical reactions involved in DNA synthesis has uh, efficiency issues, right? It's not 100% efficient, so every base you add, you accumulate errors. Uh, so how to uh, get rid of those errors uh, is, uh, is very challenging. Right now, people are using uh, cloning and sequencing to uh, get rid of, to pick the right uh, sequence, but that's very costly and uh, time consuming, right? So that's one bottleneck. And uh, if you talk about uh, making, uh, synthesizing whole genome, which is, uh, normally above uh, one million bases, uh, how to uh, assemble and handle those long sequences is another challenge, right? Because it's, I mean, the longer you get, the fragile uh, the, the sequence, uh, the molecules will become. So it's very difficult to handle that. And also how you can put that back into a, uh, into a cell or into a system where you can jumpstart the, uh, the whole process, the whole function of the genome is another challenge. Um, uh, so the, uh, uh, the synthesis of that uh, uh, first minimal uh, uh, genome proved that people can have accumulated some knowledge uh, to uh, handle this issue, but uh, moving beyond that, if you want to synthesize E. coli genome, it's still uh, a challenge that people haven't uh, been uh, able to prove that they can do that. Um, so, uh, so my work, I mean, I'm, uh, for this talk, I'm only going to focus on the first two issues. Uh, and uh, talking about some uh, progress we made uh, in those areas. <clears throat> so, so what's the problem of this, uh, the conventional gene synthesis technology that uh, uh, are currently uh, used? Uh, uh, so if you look at the uh, process for uh, the conventional uh, gene synthesis, the first step is oligosynthesis, right? We have uh, automated DNA synthesizers that can make maybe 100 base uh, long oligos, right? And that takes about half a day to a day. And then you need to uh, purify the oligos 
and uh, assemble them into genes, and that takes another uh, couple of days. Uh, and then the, the big issue of uh, error correction or, or picking the right sequence, right? And that is the tedious uh, one. You have to uh, uh, clone your gene into a vector and put that into E. coli, for example, grow them up and uh, sequence them. Uh, if you're lucky, you can pick the right uh, clone, right, from this one round. If you're not lucky, you have to probably uh, repeat this cycle, and that takes more, th more time. And uh, uh, or you have to do a site-directed mutagenesis to correct those uh, errors. So that takes uh, even more time. Um, so right now, I mean, the, uh, the price for DNA synthesis has dropped uh, significantly from uh, initially it's about $28 per base. <laughs> right now it's uh, uh, less than $1, uh, half dollar per base. But still, it's, if you're talking about large-scale synthesis or full genome synthesis, it's still very costly, right? So, the, uh, uh, so what we are trying to do is actually to... Uh, uh, to see if we can simplify this process or automate this process, for example, integrate the whole process of oligosynthesis and the gene assembly into uh, one, uh, one step, right? And uh, then try to uh, increase, the efficient, uh, increase the accuracy of gene synthesis and eliminate the, uh, the error correction step. So uh, this will drive the cost down and uh, also uh, significantly reduce the uh, the time uh, for gene synthesis. So that's the goal for uh, our research. Um, so let's talk about first to uh, how to integrate this whole process. Uh, uh, so, uh, so at that time, uh, we, uh, we thought about this question. And uh, so uh, one of the technologies that we can borrow actually was uh, the, uh, the microarray technology where you can synthesize uh, thousands or even more different oligos from a single chip, right? But the problem, the issue is uh, each oligo, I mean, even though you can synthesize many different sequences, but the amount of each oligo is still pretty small and not enough to uh, drive the uh, assembly, gene assembly uh, reaction. Um, so we have to come up with uh, uh, ways to, I mean, somehow amplify the sequences and also uh, figure out how to assemble uh, genes from this big uh, mixture of oligos. Uh, so at that time, uh, uh, this is uh, one collaboration we did with uh, a group in Texas uh, uh, and uh, using the uh, uh, microfluidic uh, uh, DNA array to uh, synthesize uh, different oligos uh, in different chambers. And this is controlled by uh, the uh, digital microMirror array, uh, which uh, I think Franco uh, Serena was one of the pioneers uh, for this technology. And uh, uh, so at that time, I also collaborated with him. Uh, and uh, so he, uh, we published uh, around the same time uh, on this technology using the uh, uh, DNA microarray to, uh, uh, to assemble genes. Uh, and uh, so this is... Uh, the type of microarray we used uh, at that time uh, using the, uh, uh, so, so if you look at the, the, the array is pretty small, right? The size of your fingernail, but it can uh, synthesize uh, thousands of oligos on a single chip. And, uh, and then to amplify uh, the amount of oligos, uh, we developed this, uh, uh, I mean, having a common primers on both ends and, uh, and then you can use a PCR-like reaction to amplify the oligos, and, uh, and then you can remove the, uh, the primers at the end uh, with a, a type uh, 2S uh, restriction enzyme, and then you release the clean oligos. You can use that for, uh, uh, to build genes, right, using those oligos. So, so in that way, you can get cheap oligos from, uh, uh, I mean, inexpensive oligos from, from the chip and, uh, uh, and it proved that we can use this, uh, this method to synthesize multiple uh, genes at a time. And, um, uh, but uh, after that, uh, uh, we realized that this technology still has limitations because you have, although you can synthesize many different oligos from one, uh, one chip, but the pool is probably very uh, complex and it's not easy to, uh, 
uh, I mean, efficiently utilize every sequence to build uh, many, many different genes as you want because of the, uh, the complexity of the, the, uh, the sequences. Uh, and uh, since then, people have been developing different uh, ways to uh, get around that. Uh, and I think there are companies uh, right now, I mean, using this technology to, uh, uh, and the different approach, approaches to uh, efficiently utilize different areas of the, uh, of the chip to uh, get as many as genes to, uh, out of the chip. Uh, so uh, some strategies, I mean, you can use bioinformatic tools to uh, design different uh, primers, right? Different PCR primers, so you can selectively amplify different regions of the chip into different pools of uh, oligos, so you can assemble them into different constructs. So that's one strategy. And uh, uh, there are other strategies that uh, companies using uh, to build tags into these oligos and uh, then uh, try to assemble them into different sequences. So uh, we took a different approach. Actually, we divided uh, uh, the strategy we used is, was actually to uh, try to divide the chip physically into different uh, areas or different uh, wells or chambers, uh, uh, if you will. So, so in each chamber, uh, we can have a smaller group of oligos uh, synthesized in each chamber, right? And then we can amplify the oligos uh, and then use the free oligos to uh, uh, assemble them into genes directly, and not, not taking out into a tube, but directly on the chip, right? So in that case, it, we not only simplified the, uh, 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 the, I mean, reduced the complexity, but also uh, integrated the uh, whole process of oligosynthesis uh, with gene assembly on the same chip, right? That's the original goal we, uh, we tried to, uh, uh, to achieve. So in this one strategy, we uh, we hope we can uh, actually uh, realize uh, that goal. So uh, for this design, we, uh, we used a different technology uh, than the original, uh, the micro array, uh, micro -mirror array uh, type uh, uh, of chip. So this time we used uh, uh, inkjet printing uh, system uh, technology. Uh, so just like the, the, the printer you have in your home, right? Instead of printing uh, ink, we can uh, put different monomers, uh, phosphoramidized uh, into, uh, uh, into the well and then put them, uh, print them on the chip to make different oligos, right? Uh, the chemistry, uh, another advantage of using this is the chemistry is uh, the same as the uh, phosphoramidized chemistry used in the standard uh, uh, DNA automated DNA synthesis, so you don't have to uh, uh, have special chemicals uh, uh, to do that, right? And that simplified and also reduced the, the cost of this process. And uh, we proved that we can uh, do this pretty well. And uh, um, uh, also, to uh, in order to achieve uh, this uh, uh, in situ. Uh, synthesis and assembly, we have to uh, make our own chip. Uh, so the conventional uh, type of chip is, I mean, use glass or silicon. Uh, but here, in order to uh, make it easy to fabricate, we used uh, a plastic chip, a COC chip, so you can easily mold uh, what kind of features you want uh, on the chip. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the common uh, micro, uh, microarray technology for DNA synthesis has an issue of a uh, higher error rate uh, than the uh, conventional uh, DNA synthesis because of the, the surface uh, issue. If you spot something on the surface, the next stop you put on may not I mean, hit the same area, right? So, so the boundary uh, shifts uh, 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 between each step, and that creates a, a much higher error rate than the, uh, uh, the, the conventional column based synthesis. So to uh, correct uh, that issue, we, uh, we actually deposited a silicon dioxide a spot on the, on the uh, uh, plastic surface. So only on the spot you can grow uh, oligos right on that. And in that case, you keep the boundary clean and reduce the error rate. Uh, so in this way, we can synthesize oligos, uh, which has a similar error rate. Uh, compared to the, uh, uh, 
the uh, conventional automated uh, DNA synthesis, uh, synthesizers, which is about one in uh, five or three uh, or six hundred bases. So that's pretty good. Uh, so with these modifications, we were able to uh, uh, put all the reactions on the same chip, but still we have to develop a new kind of uh, reaction in order to uh, uh, streamline the uh, article synthesis, amplification, and assembly, right, and uh, have them in a single well. Uh, uh, so to do that, uh, this is the strategy we used. So we synthesized uh, different articles in the same well, and, uh, and then uh, at the end of the article, we have a common primer. And using this primer, we will nail a primer onto it, we can extend, right, we can ex extend and make it into double-stranded. Uh, and also at this uh, site, there is a, a nicking site. I mean, this is, there is a nicking uh, site here where a nicking enzyme can come in, recognize the site, and make a cleavage, a single strand cleavage here. Uh, so, so once the uh, nick is made, another polymerase can come in and start uh, extending from this nick, right? And also this, this polymerase has the, uh, the DNA uh, the strand displacement activity, so it can displace the uh, uh, the strand in front of it and uh, release it into the uh, solution, and uh, that strand can participate into the uh, the DNA uh, the gene assembly process. So, uh, so in this single well, you have the mixture of enzymes and optimized buffer. You only need to uh, change uh, temperature, right? From a, uh, this is a thermal uh, isothermal. Uh, amplification, and this is a thermocycling amplification. So only by switching the temperature uh, mode, you can uh, switch from amplification to uh, assembly, right? So uh, in a single well, uh, you can actually assemble genes uh, out of it, right, without changing buffers. So that essentially uh, integrated and automated the whole process of uh, uh, the whole process of gene uh, article synthesis uh, and gene assembly. So we pretty much achieved the first goal, right, of integrating and automating the process, also miniaturizing the process. Uh, so the second goal is actually to uh, increase the accuracy of synthesis to uh, essentially eliminate eliminate the uh, the error correction, uh, the uh, cloning and sequencing process. So to do that, we uh, developed another reaction uh, which take advantage of one uh, enzyme that, which is isolated from a uh, celery uh, plant. Uh, and that enzyme has the uh, uh, activity of recognizing the mismatch structures uh, in DNA, right? If you have a mismatch, either it's caused by uh, mutation or by deletion or insertion. Uh, this enzyme can recognize all those structures, the mismatch structures, and uh, cleave it, right? Uh, if, it, if you have a high concentration of enzyme, it, it can actually make a double-stranded cleavage and, uh, 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 after the, uh, uh, the mismatch site. So that's a very uh, useful activity. So we took advantage of that uh, activity and integrated into this uh, gene synthesis process. So we just added one cycle uh, of this error correction uh, uh, reaction into it, uh, and that can essentially eliminate, mo eliminate most of the uh, errors in it. So let's, let me uh, uh, run this uh, through with you. So this is the normal uh, gene assembly process, right? You start from uh, uh, oligos, assemble oligos, uh, PCR extension into full-length genes, right? And at this step, uh, you still have a lot of errors in the full length genes. And to remove that, we uh, added this enzyme, I mean, we did a re-denaturation uh, and uh, re-anneal those so the uh, correct sequence can anneal with the uh, incorrect ones and uh, expose the errors, right, in, in the sequences. Uh, either it's uh, insertion, deletion, or mutation, right? They all form this, uh, uh, mismatch structures, which can recognize by this uh, nucleus. It's the uh, commercial name is called severe nucleus, which can recognize the uh, mismatch and uh, make cuts right after it. So it uh, exposes the uh, 
the, the mismatch sequences. And then there's the, uh, a five prime to three prime axonucleus activity in the reaction, which can remove all these uh, mismatch bases, essentially remove all the errors from it, right? And then you, uh, uh, you use the error-free fragments and reassemble them into, uh, <coughs> uh, into full lens genes, right? So in the, uh, through this one cycle, you pretty much eliminated uh, most of the, uh, the errors. And uh, so, so we sequenced a lot of those uh, 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 sequences before and after error correction. And uh, we showed that through one cycle, you can pretty much uh, uh, reduce the error frequency from uh, uh, 1.9 per kb uh, to 0 0.1.9 per kb, it's a 10-fold uh, reduction. And uh, through further optimization, and if you can, you can also do multiple runs of this reaction, we can uh, uh, pretty much reduce the error rate to uh, below one in 8,000 bases. And that's pretty much good enough for a common uh, gene synthesis, right? So meaning that uh, <clears throat> uh, if you, uh, so if you, if you compare uh, the two error rates, so if it's, uh, 1.9 per kb, essentially if you want to build uh, a sequence longer than 1 kb, uh, you pretty much don't have much, uh, any sequence left in the population which are 100% correct. And if you have an error rate uh, which is 10 times better, uh, you can still, if you build, even build a 10 kb sequence, you still have uh, more than 30% correct. So that's the difference, uh, how big a difference uh, you can make with this uh, difference in error rate, right? And uh, if you want a visual uh, demonstration, here is a, a, a GFP uh, gene that we try to synthesize with or without error, this error correction. So uh, without error correction, I mean only half of them are fluorescent. With error correction, more than 90% are fluorescent. So that's, that's the difference that uh, error correction can make in this process. Um, so hopefully, uh, I mean, we are still uh, trying to uh, uh, improve this process. Uh, and uh, I mean, this enzyme is good. It can rec recognize many, I mean, all types of uh, mismatches, but it still has an issue of efficiency towards different types of uh, uh, errors, as you can see from this study, right? It recognizes uh, deletions, insertions better than uh, mutations. So if we can uh, improve that, uh, make it more uh, sensitive to mutations, we can further uh, improve this process. So that's an ongoing uh, study we're doing. Uh, hopefully we can uh, use this type of uh, approach to eliminate most of the errors. Uh, of course, there are other approaches, such as uh, uh, my former advisor, George Church, I mean, uh, he's trying to use high super sequencing to sequence every article <laughs> and pick the correct one and then assemble them into genes. That's another approach, uh, if you can afford to have a, uh, a genome sequencer uh, in your lab. Um, so the, uh, uh, so one of the goals uh, for this research is actually to build uh, a machine that you can, I mean, put in your gene design and push a button and you get a gene product. So that's, that, I mean, just like, basically like a PCR machine or <laughs> on your bench top, you can uh, uh, have your uh, gene design and, uh, and synthesized for you. Uh, so that's pretty much the, uh, the technology uh, development uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> If I still have time, I, I'm going to talk about, uh, I mean, there are many, many applications you can do, right, with this type of uh, synthesis capability. Uh, uh, I mean, you can make, for example, large uh, libraries of uh, genes, or you can make uh, a whole genome, right, genome synthesis. And uh, so today I'm going to uh, just talk about one application uh, we did, which is on the uh, regulation of protein expression. Um, and focusing on the, uh, the codon optimization part of it. Uh, I mean, there are different ways that you can regulate uh, expression of a gene, right? Uh, some of the common ones include a promoter, right? You can 
uh, use different promoter sequences to uh, change its strength. Uh, also, you can modify the uh, ribosomal binding site, uh, change the uh, ribosome binding activity, uh, affinity, so give you different uh, uh, strengths of uh, initiation. And also, you can uh, uh, change codons uh, of the gene. Right? Using different codons, you can change. Uh, uh, I mean, people have been shown you can uh, you are able to uh, uh, change the uh, protein expression level just by changing the codons. Uh, however, the uh, the rule for codon usage uh, is not quite clear. I mean, there are softwares out there or company use software to design uh, the codons for you, but uh, uh, half of the time, I mean, didn't work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you try this, uh, I mean, send to uh, uh, the instances companies, okay, you, you optimize this for me, and they will send you back <coughs> a sequence, and you try it yourself. Uh, so half of the time, it, it didn't work. Uh, it showed that people just don't understand uh, completely the rules involved in codon optimization. And there are many factors involved, uh, which I'm not going to uh, go through every one of them, uh, but GC content uh, secondary structure or the uh, adaptation, uh, codon adaptation indexes uh, are all shown to be uh, 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 key factors in that. But just how they play together is, is a big issue. I mean, how you design the software that can incorporate all these uh, factors into it is, uh, is a big challenge. And people have been shown that uh, uh, in the, in the uh, gene sequence or RNA sequence, uh, if you just change one codon, and that can totally uh, screw up the whole translation process. And uh, how can you design a software to predict that? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so with our technology, uh, we were thinking, okay, probably we can uh, use this uh, high throughput synthesis approach to uh, solve this by design and synthesize many different versions of it and see which one work best, right? So if you accumulate enough data, you can probably uh, derive some kind of rules out of it. Uh, so to do that, uh, we, uh, the first step, I mean, you, you, you have been able to, uh, you need to be able to synthesize big libraries, right? Codon variants uh, libraries. And in order to clone that into a vector, uh, I mean, there are some, uh, uh, strategies that you can do that, but we developed our own because it's simple. Uh, so it's basically like a PCR. I mean, you have your vector and you have your library, right? Uh, and uh, the only requirement is you need to have overlapping regions between the two, and then you uh, nail them and extend them and transform directly into E. coli, and that's it. It's pretty simple, and it's not sequence dependent. You don't have to do uh, digestion ligation because it's a complex library, right? It must have every <laughs> restriction size in it, so you cannot uh, use uh, those kind of approach. Uh, but this is pretty simple. You just uh, one round of PCR, you can uh, uh, pretty much uh, get your uh, library cloned. And also you can use this to uh, assemble uh, uh, a number of fragments uh, in one step into, the, uh, uh, into a plasmid and uh, uh, clone it into a, and grow that into the cell, and we prove that uh, it can work uh, pretty well uh, to uh, close to 10 kb, uh, uh, the whole construct. Um, so using uh, this approach, we uh, we did a pilot experiment to see okay whether we can uh, just by uh, varying the codon uh, uh, usage uh, we can achieve. A spectrum of different uh, expression levels. And uh, so we used the Lexi Alpha uh, as a demonstration, and it showed that it worked pretty well. I mean, this is the wild type uh, uh, construct, Lexi Alpha. You have very uh, even, uniform distribution of colors. And uh, this is a codon variance uh, we did, uh, we synthesized and cloned into them and, uh, uh, and played them out. You can see there are great variations of colors, right, uh, meaning the uh, uh, different expression levels of this single protein. Um, so that's a demonstration that, uh, I mean, this approach work uh, for uh, alterating the uh, uh, protein expression level. Uh, so here, this figure shows, uh, a is, is a demonstration that uh, 
we designed over uh, 1,300 different codon variants, and uh, we measured their expression uh, based on the color, uh, the legacy uh, color. And uh, so, so here you can see, I mean, we can have very strong expression all the way to a very low expression level and everything in between, right? So it's a demonstration that by altering the, uh, the codon usage, you can pretty much get uh, uh, every single level of different expression, uh, protein expression level. And this is a de uh, distribution of all these uh, constructs, and you can see the, uh, the expression level. It's very interesting that this is the wild type expression level, and most of the, uh, uh, the sequences, uh, I mean, have this uh, expression level. And about a third of them have expression level higher and uh, two thirds lower. So uh, we are in the process of uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, what factors are involved in this process. And also we are doing uh, a number of different proteins uh, using this approach to see uh, uh, if we can find a common rule uh, involved in this process. And also we do, we're doing this in different organisms, different cell types to see if there are, vari I mean, there, there must be variations, but we just want to see what are the variations, what are the causes of these variations. Uh, and here is just a video showing you the, uh, the panel I showed you before, the, uh, uh, the expression level and the speed uh, of these different constructs. <coughs> So, so this is a demonstration that, uh, I mean, this approach can generate uh, uh, all types of different expression levels for the same protein. And uh, to make it, I mean, practical to work on a, a real problem, we uh, uh, happen to have a collaboration with, uh, uh, with Kevin uh, White at the uh, University of Chicago uh, Genome Center. So they are doing uh, 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 the ENCODE project where they need to uh, 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 to, make to make antibodies for uh, all the, uh, the uh, Drosophila transcription factors. But uh, after they tried that in E. coli, they found most of, I mean, uh, at least half of them don't express in E. coli. Uh, so, so, he, so he asked me if I can help using this technology to uh, express all those uh, sequences that uh, normally does not exp uh, do not express in E. coli. So I said, oh, okay, I can try. So he gave me 75 of those. And uh, so I, went through the whole process that I just described. So you design the library, you make them, uh, you synthesize uh, libraries. So, so each band is a library for all, uh, uh, for all the codon variants for a single gene. And uh, so we made all 75 of them. And uh, 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 so we made the whole library and just screened them and uh, picked the, the best expressing ones. So as you can see, compared uh, to the uh, uh, the wild type, which pretty much don't express at all, uh, after optimization, you can have a fat band there, right, which uh, is about more than 50% of the whole cell protein is that band. Uh, so we, we demonstrate that we can make all 75 work using this, uh, this type of approach. And uh, so it'd be nicer t uh, if after uh, we do many, many different uh, genes, we can figure out the, the rules and then design a software so you don't have to go through this process. You can just design one and <laughs> uh, get the, uh, the highest uh, uh, yield uh, you want. Uh, and also, this is, technology is also good for picking the uh, intermediate levels. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, have some usage in synthetic biology where people build uh, uh, synthetic networks where they want to regulate the expression of each component in it, right? So normally in that, you have a, a promoter that drive a, a string of proteins, but how can you uh, uh, manipulate the relative expression of each protein? Uh, I mean, using the same promoter, right? This is probably one approach that you can use. And uh, for that, you probably don't want the highest expression for every one of them, right? You want intermediate levels. And I think this approach can probably uh, provide that kind of uh, uh, solution uh, to that problem. Uh, so, uh, with that, I want to uh, I pretty much, uh, that's pretty much uh, all I want to talk about today. And I would like to, uh, uh, to thank people uh, who did the work and also the funding uh, agencies. Uh, so, so, after I talked about this work, I mean, a lot of people 
just want to try try it out and want to uh, 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 take advantage of uh, some of these technologies. So uh, obviously, this cannot be done in the academic lab, right? I don't have students that <laughs> can constantly work on other projects. So I set up a, a operation um, that uh, uh, if you have this kind of uh, uh, need, that uh, I can probably offer some help uh, on that. Um, so with that, I'll stop here. <clears throat> Uh, how many assemblies I can do on a single chip? All right. Uh, so currently, we uh, uh, we have designs that you can have 30 uh, different constructs on a single chip, but uh, uh, but you can very easily yeah uh, enlarge that or yeah make it more even more right. Mm -hmm. Uh, to structures of proteins? Uh, so you're talking about the, the final uh, three-dimensional structure of a protein and not the RNA secondary structure? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't think people have been able to uh, address that issue with the current synthesis technology because it's, <laughs> it's pretty hard. Uh, yeah, you need to uh, have yeah, significant number in order to uh, do this correlation. But uh, in one of the slides I showed you, uh, uh, okay. so in this one, uh, it's an accidental uh, discovery uh, where uh, there's only one, uh, I think one codon change, and that can alter actually the protein, the final protein structure. Uh, not necessarily, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but later people figured out it's probably caused by the, uh, uh, the folding process, right? So if you have a one change of codon, uh, one codon change, and that alters the, uh, uh, the speed, uh, the, micro, uh, the, uh, the ribosome uh, uh, migrate along the mRNA, and that causes a change in the, uh, 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 the protein folding process and makes the protein less stable than the original one. Um, but, uh, but you're right, I mean, that, that's probably one of the uh, 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 initial proof that uh, codon usage can actually affect protein structure. Uh, but how, the people haven't been able to <laughs> yeah, dig into that, yeah. So, um, you stated that the gene synthesis is now 30 cents to a dollar a base. Is that he, yeah, depending on the length. If it's long, long, longer ones, it's more expensive. Yeah. Is most of that cost the oligosynthesis? Uh, no, oligosynthesis is, is about uh, uh, well, actually, ten cents per base if you buy oligos. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's uh, less than a, probably less than a third of it is oligosynthesis. Ten cents a base, did you say? Yeah, yeah, less than a so third. About of a third of it. the. Yeah. A third of the fifth the cost is really the oligo. So right. is, is, um, is there much error correction going on in the, when mm. you buy oligos off a machine instead of off a chip? No, no, no. There's not much error correction going on. Uh, most of the synthesis companies, they just do cloning and sequencing. That's it. <laughs> yeah, they don't do much error correction. Uh, uh, yeah. What's the next big step? <laughs> in synthetic biology or in just in, field. in my field? Uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, if you can, suppose you can do large scale uh, chip uh, inexpensive DNA synthesis uh, or gene assembly, uh, suppose you can, I mean, synthesize anything you want. I think the next step is uh, one is to find out the rules uh, how yeah, those sequences can control the functions of life, right? Uh, figure out that, and also uh, applications. You can, uh, I mean, once you learn the rules, you can use the rules to uh, help you build different 
for example, design different proteins, enzymes, or design different uh, genomes, you can achieve uh, different functions with those designs. I think that's, uh, uh, that could be one of the directions. Uh, actually, yeah, a lot of people are working on that. Uh, but there are probably further, <laughs> uh, more significant developments uh, in the future. Yeah, probably only uh, people like you can predict. <laughs> So. Between creating life and making genes, uh -huh. where is the limit of what size DNA you can physically assemble? Uh, limit. Uh, how are people addressing it? Right, right. Uh, I guess, I mean, uh, for synthetic DNA, it's, uh, the length could be a bigger issue than the, uh, 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 the, the in vivo DNA, because in vivo you have proteins, uh, factors bind. Uh, DNA to protect it, right? And uh, in vitro, it's just a bare DNA you want to synthesize, and uh, the longer it gets, the fragile it gets, right? Uh, the more fragile it gets. So it's, uh, the handling becomes an issue, right? And also uh, assembly becomes an issue. Uh, so right now, the assembly uh, uh, for bigger chunks uh, is mostly done in vivo. You put them into yeast using the yeast recombination system, assemble them. Uh, in vitro, there are uh, enzymatic reactions that you can do to assemble them, but uh, the length, there, there is a limit, all right? And people can do over 100, base, uh, over 100 KB uh, using an in vitro system, uh, but most of the larger ones is done in vivo, in yeast. So, uh, and, uh, so how, how big a construct the yeast can handle is probably, <laughs> yeah, remains to be uh, determined. Uh, so I guess there might be some limitations. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we tried. Uh, we actually uh, varied the, uh, uh, a lot of the factors uh, in here. Uh, try to build libraries uh, based on the uh, variation of a single factor, like, for example, GC content, right? We can try uh, the same gene. We can do 20% uh, GC content versus 80% GC content and see uh, how that can affect uh, expression levels. And uh, there is a big uh, influence, yeah, uh, just the GC content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's also a limit on that. Uh, uh, if you use a high GC level, uh, it, it gets very difficult to assemble uh, or synthesize, even synthesize the sequence. Uh, uh, using the chip technology? Uh, you can get uh, down to lower than one cent per base uh, or even lower, yeah, it's for the optimization. Right. Uh, there are no more questions. Let's thank Dr. Tian. Mm -hmm. Thank you.